Hello, welcome back everybody to this week's A Different Perspective. So if you all remember from last week, we went over some stuff with the immune system. We talked about our body's innate ability to respond, some of the cells, some of the systems that take place. So this week, we're going to talk about a couple of different things as well. So I'm going to wait for just a couple minutes and see if anybody else hops on here. Alrighty, so if you guys, again, if you remember from last week, what we talked about was the first three boxes here. So we talked about some of the protective mechanisms we have, those cells, if you remember the macrophages and dendritic cells that help to identify and recognize viruses and things that come across those cells, or the membranes into the body, how we can get rid of cells with natural killer cells, and then some of the CD8 uh, and CD4 natural killer cells. So what we're going to be talking about today is this top box up in here. The CD4 cells, how those signal B cells, and that innate immune response specifically for viruses and cancer infected cells. So look in here again, if you remember just a quick rundown of last week to make sure we're all on the same page. If you missed last week, go back, check that out. Um, but basically, basic breakdown here of the immune system is when we get a cut in a barrier. So whether it's a cut in my skin, an ulcer in my stomach, something comes in that I breathe in, our body's gonna recognize that toxin or that bacteria right away. We're gonna have CD4 T helper cells that signal a couple different things. They signal our CD8 cells, B cells, and we eradicate and get rid of whatever it is that's in there. So that's kind of where we left off last week. So this week what we're gonna talk about is how the medical system addresses and, and tries to manipulate the immune system, some of the problems that we get with that, and then the way that we look at things. And we are gonna go over a couple of really really cool case studies today. So hang around for that because I'm gonna to talk to you guys about some of the things that we've done in the past with some of our patients that have come in and what's gone on specifically with them that's depleted their immune systems uh, and how that can leave you at risk. So first thing here to understand is how the medical system approaches this. If you're familiar with the medical systems, medications, drugs, things like that, what they're gonna be focusing on is antibody responses, right? So with COVID, the biggest thing has been, we gotta have antibodies, right? And we're doing everything we can with injectable medications, things like that, trying to increase that antibody response. And the second that that response declines, we wanna get a booster, get our next round to make sure that that antibody response stays up. Now that's how we look at viral responses, um, pneumonia, HIV, AIDS, things like that. We really focus on that antibody response, especially with COVID. Now we know exactly what that is. Now, there's some other things that can go on that makes it maybe not the best idea to only be focusing on the antibody response. And you're going to understand a little bit more about that as we go. So again, that antibody response, really we're focusing on just this top corner there. And if you were with me last week, you can already understand how much more complicated the immune system is than just focusing on antibodies. So if we look at just that initial antibody response that we're looking for, basically what an antibody is, is a, it's a protein. So it's called immunoglobulin. We have four or five different types of those immunoglobulins. They're specialized blood cells that identify and neutralize uh, material that's foreign to an immune system. So with autoimmune conditions, things like that, that's when we start to form antibodies against our own healthy tissue or healthy tissue. We're gonna talk about one of the most common autoimmune conditions, Hashimoto's thyroiditis next week and we'll go over a little bit more about that immune function with that and how that breaks down. But basically what an antibody does is it identifies something that's not supposed to be in the body, binds to it, makes it easier for our body to get rid of it. And that's why we always wanna have those antibodies for different things um, because it does help to speed up the process of getting rid of that virus or whatever it is that's in the body. Basically the way an antibody works is we have an antigen. So if you remember an antigen last week, that's gonna be something like the spike protein, right? So those spikes that are on the outside of that viral shell, that's what allows the body to recognize that that does not belong here. The antibody is gonna to bind to that. We're gonna create what's called an antigen antibody complex. 
that's going to do a couple of things. So it's going to inactivate that virus. It's going to bind to it. It can neutralize it by covering up that protein with a spike on the outside that allows it to bind to the human cells. It can bind a bunch of things together, clump them together, and solidify them so it's much easier for the body to get rid of them. After that happens, then it makes it easier for our cells to eat or destroy those, creates an inflammatory response that drives more immune cells to that area, and then releases that complement cascade, creates the cell death that we want. So the antibodies are creating a very important response. Biggest thing with the antibodies is just thinking binding them together. So if you think about the way that your trash system works, so you put a bunch of trash in your trash can, you set the trash out to the curb, and then we have the dump truck or the garbage truck that comes by, picks the trash up. Now, you putting all of your trash into a trash can makes it way easier for the garbage man to pick your trash up compared to if you just put a bunch of things out to the curb and then they had to go pick them up one by one. So you can see how that would expedite the process of getting rid of your trash by having it all in one place. Now imagine in the situation that you put the trash can out to the curb, but it's a holiday, so now the garbage truck doesn't come. Now, that trash isn't gonna just go away, it's gonna continue to sit there. And that's kind of what that antibody is. So if you think about the antibody as the trash can that binds everything together, puts everything in one place, and then we have other cells, natural killer cells, CD8 cells that come in and they remove that trash from the side of the street. Those are more of our garbage trucks. So as we talk about the way that the body actually responds to some of these medical treatments that they try to give you, basically what they're doing is they're getting rid of the garbage truck at the expense of giving you more garbage cans. So they're increasing that antibody response at the expense of suppressing your T response and after we talk about this a little bit today, we'll show you some examples of exactly where that's happened and the things that we've had to do to overcome that. There's four main classes of antibodies that are important to understand. Now, we're not going to get super deep into antibodies. We just need to understand there's different types that should be high at different points in time. So IgG antibodies, these are the most common circulating antibodies in blood. Those are the antibodies that bind to a specific antigen, a specific protein that's not supposed to be there. We have IgA antibodies, those are specific to mucosal barriers. Think about like the gut, the lungs, the nose, anywhere that the outside world meets the inside. On the other side of those barriers where we have those mucosal membranes. IgM antibodies, those are gonna be the first antibodies that spike up really high immediately following an infection. So that's one of the ways that we can tell if you have an acute infection versus a chronic infection, or if you were just exposed to something in the past, is the difference between the IgG and the IgM antibody levels. And then your IgE antibodies are gonna be the ones that create those anaphylactic histamine responses if you think about food allergies and things like that. Now this is a response to a viral infection, basically an in antibody response that we should see. So this would be normal. Right here is where we see the administration of that antigen, so that's gonna be our exposure. First thing that happens after exposure is we see this big uptick or a big spike in those IgM antibodies. Now, this is what's really important to understand is that it's normal for those antibodies to spike really high and it's also normal for them to come right back down to normal. We should not always have antibodies circulating through our blood to specific antigens. After that initial spike in IgM antibodies, we're gonna see a delayed smaller rise in IgG antibodies. And again, those come back down and level off and go back to a normal level. So if we understand that this is the normal response to a viral infection, that's a normal antibody response, then it already contraindicates itself that we are trying to induce a situation through medications, vaccines, whatever it is, that's keeping those antibody levels increased all the time. So if you've had your COVID antibodies tested, they'll usually test a couple different things. They'll test your IgM and your IgG antibodies, test a couple different things too, depending on exactly which test you've had. But that helps to tell you if you had a recent exposure or a delayed exposure. And if you test it over time, which I've tested on myself actually, and I should have put those labs in here. I didn't put those labs in the slides today. But you can actually see how my antibody levels decrease over time, which is my body's normal reaction. If I were to go spike those antibodies up again, now I'm just perpetuating that heightened immune response that's gonna create damage down the road. So let's look at what weakens the immune system. Because if we look at the medical's approach to trying to strengthen that immune response, we have to understand where the immune response is at in the first place. Understanding that we have to have a really strong T cell reaction, which is those garbage trucks again, 
we have to have a lot of those guys circulating if we want to be able to handle anything regardless of whether we have antibodies to it or not. So again, we're going to focus on what now we do that decreases those antibodies. And I want you to think about the things that you've been primed and programmed to think over the last two years and see if that's going to help you strengthen your immune system or if the things that they're doing to you are going to weaken your immune system. So as we go through this list here, the first one, mental stress. Watching the news creates fear. Fear creates mental stress. Everybody is always perpetuating this fear straight. We're all stressed out because of it. That stress immediately decreases our immune system, you can see. The links between the psychological features of cancer risk and progression have been studied through psychoneuroimmunology. The persistent activation of the HPA axis in chronic stress response and in depression impairs the immune response. So chronic stress. How many people here are under chronic stress? Just throw your hand up because I know I'm talking to a lot of you, myself included, that are always stressed out. Now, that stress response is depleting our immune system. So if we want to build strong, healthy immune systems and be able to recover from viral infections, we have to work on handling our stress better. Next one is sugar. How many people remember when we first got the vaccines and Krispy Kreme said, anybody who comes and shows a vaccine card gets a free donut, which is all sugar. McDonald's was doing the similar stuff. Again, full of sugar, tons of stuff that's bad for us. The reason sugar is really bad for us is because sugar can actually directly inhibit vitamin C from being absorbed into neutrophils, which are very important immune cells that we talked about. I don't think we actually talked about neutrophils last week. Those are very important in bacterial infections. So if we're suppressing that neutrophil uh, response by eating sugar, again, we're, we're one step behind the game because we're suppressing our immune response. Looking at loneliness now, loneliness predicts pain, depression, and fatigue, and it causes immune dysregulation. So let's just go and isolate everybody. Everybody has to work from home. Now you're not getting that social interaction. The other thing that goes along with working from home, not being out and about, is the lack of movement. And again, we know that physical activity is very important for having a really strong immune response. And this research actually shows that having less physical activity reduces your body's ability to have a really functional and strong, robust immune response. So the first five, we've hit all five of those that we're being programmed to do on a regular basis. So everything that you're being taught and told are things that are actually suppressing your immune response. How about sleep? Because everybody sleeps really great, right? When you're stressed out, when you've been by yourself all day, you haven't had good physical activity, there's probably no way you're gonna be sleeping right either. And we actually know that that sleep cycle gets us into a chronic cycle where the immune system gets suppressed, our body's fighting infections, things like that. We can't sleep as well. The lack of sleep suppresses our immune system, so we end up fighting more infections. And we get into this loop that we can't get out of. So again, really emphasizing the importance of getting that really good sleep. Females, you need more sleep. More like eight to nine to 10 hours a day is what you really need for your body to be able to function normally. So think about that. If you're not getting that, again, your immune system is gonna be paying the price as a result of that. How about low vitamin D levels? Now down here in sunny Florida, where a lot of us are at, vitamin D levels aren't gonna be as low because we have access to the beautiful sunshine. Up in the northern climates where we don't have that access to sunshine, vitamin D tends to decrease. Now, again, a little precursor, a little hint for what we're gonna be going over in next week's A Different Perspective video is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Research has shown that anywhere between 70 to 92% of people with Hashimoto's actually have vitamin D levels below 30. So there's a huge correlation between autoimmune diseases, immune dysfunction, and that low level of vitamin D. So if you're not already getting out in the sun, again, getting movement, just go for a walk in the sunshine every day, you're gonna be improving at least two of those things. The vitamin D, the sunshine, also helps to affect your sleep patterns and your circadian rhythm. So getting out and exposing yourself to sunshine, getting physical activity, you're gonna sleep better. And now we've got three of those things that we're working on increasing right off the bat. Then we'll hit the last one on the list here, which is medication. And this is the big one, and this is where I just get so fired up because of how backwards our healthcare system is. So if we talk about weakening our immune response, if you had to guess what the number one prescribed, not the number one prescribed, but the number one grossing, AKA what makes the most money every single year in the United States and worldwide is Humira. So for those of you who don't know what Humira is, it's prescribed for a lot of rheumatoid arthritis, things like that, autoimmune conditions, and it's an immune suppressant. 
So the number one grossing medication to the tune of 19.9, almost 20 billion with a B dollars every single year is immune suppressing medications. If you look at the number five grossing medication, $7.13 billion worldwide. Again, Enbrel, another immune suppressant medication. So chances are you or someone you know is taking an immunosuppressant medication. Now, the other thing that really suppresses immune system is cancer treatment because cancer is a problem with the immune system. So when the medical system can't figure out what caused it and what triggered the immune system to dysfunctional in the first place, they give you immunosuppressant medications. And there we go, three, four, six, eight, nine, and 10 are all cancer medications. So if that just shows you the direction that our country is going, we're going in the wrong path. We're suppressing our immune system, and then it's no wonder why we're susceptible when something like COVID comes around and people get very sick as a result of that. We're setting ourselves up for failure with the things that we're doing every single day. The stress, the sugar, the loneliness, lack of movement, lack of sleep, smoking, vitamin D, medications, the way that we're eating. All of these things are killing our immune system. Medications in the US alone, the top 10 medications that suppress the immune system, almost $53 billion every single year. And if you look at that worldwide, $87.42 billion every single year is made off of immune suppressant medications. If that doesn't get you fired up and upset, then I don't know what will. Now, we didn't even talk about some of the other medications. These are medications that you take orally or injected. There's a whole other round of medications that are injected intramuscularly called vaccines. Now, when we talked about earlier antibody responses, vaccines are primarily targeted at increasing your antibody responses. They have to trick your immune system to create antibody response in the absence of a natural exposure to a virus. Now, what happens is that that's at the expense of your T cells. T cells, again, are those garbage collectors, your CD4 and your CD8 cells. Now, what happens is after a vaccination, the T cell response spikes and skyrockets and then it comes back down below normal. So while we're increasing our antibodies, which we can measure in blood, we know that they do that, that's not what we're contesting here. We're creating a situation where now we have all the antibodies that we need, the trash is going out to the curb, but we don't have the garbage collector coming to pick it up. Now, when we talk about the T cell response, that's gonna be a specific response elicited for specific viruses across the board and it's a natural response so your body should be able to identify virus cancer infected cells things like that that are not normal regardless of what it is regardless of whether it's covid whether it's pneumonia whatever the viral infection is epstein bar your body should be able to recognize that and get rid of it now we put ourselves in a situation where we have a bunch of antibodies for one specific virus so yes we're going to be less susceptible to that virus however since we've tanked our t-cell response now we're susceptible to everything else. And guys, I really want you to understand how important this is gonna be down the line when we're creating this immune suppression. Now, the other thing that the vaccines rely on is having a normal immune response. How many people do you think in this country have a normal immune response who don't have any of the things on this list who haven't been taking this medication? Not a lot. So if you don't have a normal immune response to begin with, how are we gonna to expect to recover from a vaccine that's gonna tank that immune response even more? And if you don't believe me, these are things that we can actually test and see and look at on labs. Now, if we wanna see the way that the medical system tests this, it's simple. They test the CBC. CBC is a complete blood count. We talked a little bit about this last week. This is what a CBC looks like. This is actually an expanded CBC because it has a differential on it. Sorry getting a little bit wound up here. But CBCs are awesome. They show your white blood cells, which is just a snapshot of all of your immune cells. They show your red blood cells and then a breakdown of what those red blood cells look like. Now, if you've run a differential, which I'll give some credit, almost everybody is running a differential now. It's a difference between $5 and $5.50. So if you had a CBC run without a differential, that's crazy. But that differential is going to show you a breakdown of your granulocytes, which are your neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, and basophils. Shows you a percentage and a number. This is what a normal CBC should look like. Now, out of all of these cells here, zero of them are represented on a CBC. So a CBC is good at indicating whether you are sick right now or whether you have chronic suppression. 
but it doesn't tell us anything about your risk factors for developing cancer or being susceptible to a virus like COVID. Believe it or not, we can actually test all of those things, but for whatever reason, they don't look at them. The only time they ever test things like a lymphocyte enumeration helper, your CD4, CD8 ratio, natural killer cells, is if HIV or if you have cancer already. Now, we know by testing these things ahead of time, we can actually, number one, we can identify your risk, but once we've seen that you are at risk or that something has already happened, we can actually help to repair the body, get your immune system functioning again so that you're not gonna continue to be at risk. And that's the really cool thing about what we do. Now, if you look at what a lymphocyte enumeration panel looks like, remember, all of the cells that we talked about right here, macrophage or dendritic cells, natural killer cells, CD4 cells, CD8 cells, B cells, our antibody cells, we can actually test every single one of those. We can test our total T cells, we can test our T helper cells, our CD4 cells, our CD8 cells, our natural killer cells, and our B cells, which are right here, CD19 B cells. And then we can look at the ratio of our CD4 to CD8 cells. Now, if you're familiar with the treatment of HIV, CD4, CD8 ratio is what they look at. That number has got to be above one. Ideally, one and a half to two would be better. The stronger that number is, the better your body's gonna be capable of fighting an infection. Now, this is a normal panel here. Everything on this panel looks pretty good. This is a patient who came in, they just wanted to check and see where they were at, and they're actually in a really good space. So I can confidently tell this patient that their body is equipped and has the resources that it needs to be able to fight a viral infection, and that their risk of developing cancer is going to be low because their immune system is strong enough to identify those tissues and clear them out of the body. Now, unfortunately, that's not always the case. This next person's lab that we're gonna talk about is someone who came in and we just ran their blood a couple months ago, so I don't have follow-ups for this specific patient, but this is a patient who got COVID in August. Ever since that, she's just been dealing with terrible sickness. So she used to never get sick in her life. She got COVID and now it's every couple of weeks she's just getting knocked out. She gets sick all the time, over and over and over again, and has not been able to figure it out. Now, the thing that really pushed her over the edge was actually her heart palpitations. So she started developing heart palpitations after she got COVID. She went to her cardiologist. Her cardiologist put her on a beta blocker and said, just take this, you'll be fine. Doesn't even try to figure out why the heart palpitations are happening in the first place. Their response is, you have heart palpitations, here's a medication that's gonna slow your heart down. Take this, you'll be good. And she felt better for a little bit. And then what happened? Everything started coming back. She doesn't, she's young, she's barely 30. She should not have to be on a heart medication for the rest of her life because she got sick in August, right? So her goal is to come off of that heart medication. We ran her immune panel because I wanna see the toll that COVID took on her immune system. Unfortunately, we can't see where it was at before she had COVID, but looking at where it's at now, we're in a very bad spot. CD4 cells, third one down here, low. Natural killer cells, low. CD4, CD8 ratio, low. It's no wonder she keeps getting sick over and over and over again because her body is so depleted, she can't fight any infections. Now we talked about that CD4, CD8 ratio has got to be above one. Now, if you just looked at these patients' labs, it looks like she has HIV or she has cancer. And if that's the medical system, that's what they're gonna tell you based on looking at these labs. I know that that's not the case because I took a history. And what actually happened with this patient, and I didn't put the rest of the lab up here today, is that she had a reactivation of Epstein-Barr virus. So Epstein-Barr, for those of you who don't know, is mono. A lot of us have been exposed to mono, get it from kissing, it's swapped through mucus and saliva. And unfortunately, mono or Epstein-Barr is one of those viruses that tends to lay dormant if our body's not strong enough to get rid of it right away. Now, her Epstein-Barr virus had been dormant, wasn't causing any problems, but what happened was COVID was such a stress on her immune system that it allowed that dormant virus to become active again. Now, granted, this blood test was done in April, so it's been a full eight months since she was sick, and she still has an active viral infection going on. Now, the reason she can't suppress that viral infection is because her, seat, her natural killer cells are so low they can't do anything. So natural killer cells, those specific guys right there that are gonna pick up that trash. And her CD4 cells are very low. Now in this case, her CD8 cells are okay, 
they're significantly lower than where I think it should be, but they didn't get specifically flagged out of range. The problem is that those CD4 cells are never gonna, or the CD8 cells are never gonna actually be activated if we don't have enough CD4 cells. So she's decent here, absolutely terrible here, but because she can't get this activation to happen, she's not gonna be able to form CD8 cells, and she's also not gonna be able to form that antibody response. So this is a perfect idea of a patient where if you wanted to give them an injection of something to create a vaccine response, she doesn't have the resources that she needs to create that vaccine response. And if we tank her T cells even lower, it's gonna be a very bad day. Now, this is a patient where I was up front with her. I told her, your immune system is not in a good spot right now. But the good news is that we can actually correct a lot of this stuff and boost the immune system. Naturally, through supplementation, things like that, we can feed those pathways in those cells so that this does not have to continue on for her. And I'm gonna show you an example of that right now. So this is a patient 50 something year old male, he actually came in because he got the vaccine and he wanted to just see what had happened in his body as a result of that. Now, again, we don't have the pre on this patient to see where he was at before, but again, I can tell you where he's at now and it's the same story. CD4 cells, very low. Absolute natural killer cells, again, very low. This might be the same patient. There we go, this is patient. So, sorry, ignore that last one. Overall, absolute CD3 cells. So CD3 cells is gonna be our total CD, or our total T cells, think CD4 plus CD8, very low. CD4 cells, very low. T cells, also very low. Hmm. We wanted to create a B cell response. We wanted to create an antibody response, but our B cells are very low. And if you look at where natural killer cells are here, the percentage actually got flagged as high because of how low everything else is. But if we look at where this number is at compared to where it needs to be, it's still a little bit lower than what it needs to be. So with this patient, this is gonna be somebody who, yeah, they're okay here, so they might be able to clean up, but they're tanked there and they're tanked there. And those CD8 cells are the specific guys that are gonna go in and clean up that specific virus. So natural killer cells are gonna be more um, across the board, non-specific. First line of defense, the cytotoxic CD8 T cells, those are the specific troops that are gonna go in and attack that specific virus. So number one, we can't coordinate the response, we can't form an antibody response, and we don't have enough of those specific guys to go in and target. So again, this is someone who's gonna be a bad day for them. Good news is that by actually testing these things and understanding how the body's functioning and where we're at, we can start to fix this. And so we put this patient on a protocol of some supplements and we retested. So you can see 1217 of 21, we retested 328 of 22. Now, a lot of red the first time, zero red the second time. So already we know we're in a better place than where we were before. So based on where we wanna see these, we're moving in the right direction. Now we're not out of the woods yet. You can see every single thing came up here. Absolute CD3, or the natural killer cells went from 376 to 393, those should be 400. We're almost perfect with where we want the natural killer cells to be. The B cells, 68, we went to 92. Now, we're just barely at the bottom of that range. Again, not out of the woods yet, moving in the right direction, better than where we were before. Absolute CD4 cells, sorry, T helper cells, 467 up to 529, moving in the right direction. Uh, CD8 cells, 336 up to 428, moving in the right direction. Now this patient had a huge, a huge stress on the immune system. But just because you had a big stress on the immune system does not mean that we can't fix those things. And that's the coolest thing about being able to test and understand where these patients are at, is that we can overcome a lot of these challenges. We can see if you're at risk for things like viral infections, cancer, whatever it is, all your other chronic diseases, we can test for a lot of that and actually identify risk factors. And then we can correct those so that we can understand how, how your body's gonna function and put your body in a better position to function normally. And if we look at what it takes to build a strong immune system. So if you watched the last video, you'll know there's three different things we have to look at. The barrier immune response, which is the protective barriers on the outside of the skin, the innate immune response, and the acquired immune response. And depending on where that breakdown is happening along this pathway, we can give you very specific things. So looking at 
some of the different things that we can target. Now, I don't want you to see elderberry, to see reishi, to see chaga, and go buy it, because if you don't know where your immune system's at, these things are not gonna help you. And just because you can go buy it at Walmart does not mean that it's gonna be strong enough to actually do anything. So if you wanna get control of your immune system, come in, let us test it. Let us give you specific stuff for you and your body to function normally. It also comes down to what triggered that immune suppression in the first place, which we'll continue to talk about different things throughout this perspective series here. So elderberry, looking at those monocytes, the macrophages, the dendritic cells, those first line of defense cells. Elderberry is awesome if you're sick actively, if you just got sick to help boost that immediate response. Vitamin C, we talked about how vitamin C gets pushed out of those receptor sites on neutrophils because of sugar. So if you have a lot of sugar circulating through your immune, your system, number one, cut the sugar. If you're sick, cut the sugar twice as much. You cannot heal your body if you're constantly inflaming it. That's the first thing. But one of the benefits of increasing vitamin C while you're sick is you're gonna put more vitamin C than sugar at that receptor site. You're gonna have a higher chance of vitamin C binding the receptor and creating a healthy neutrophil that's gonna have that healthy response. Looking at elderberry, there's tons of research guys out here on all of these herbs and supplements that we use in our office. It's not rocket science and it's not secret information. These are things that anybody can go and look at and find. The difference is that this is not an $87 billion industry. You can't make a billion dollars when people are feeling good and healthy and their bodies are functioning normally. Looking at natural killer cells, that was a huge one. Again, we talked a lot about natural killer cells today. Echinacea, reishi, research shows that it increases natural killer cells. So if we see that you have low natural killer cells, we can give you these things. And this is what's going to happen. We're gonna go from this to this when we start taking these supplements and these things to actually help boost the immune system and the body's ability to function. Reishi increases natural, natural killer cell cytotoxicity. So again, research. Who was this research done by? The Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. So cancer centers understand these things. They understand the role of natural killer cells. How many people were ever told that the mushroom was gonna help you with your cancer treatment or that the mushroom's gonna help prevent your body from getting cancer? Exactly. No one's ever told any of these things because you can't make money off of it. But if we can understand where your body's at and improve your body's ability to function normally, you're not gonna have to go down that pathway and you're not gonna have to take all these medications. Again, echinacea associated with significant sustained increase in the number of circulating total white blood cells, our entire immune system's ability to function. Monocytes, neutrophils, and natural killer cells, the three big ones we talked about. First line defense and that nonspecific, immediate phagocytic response, clearing those guys out. We're gonna to start to increase our body's ability to function normally. And the last one I believe that we'll talk about tonight is chaga, looking at B cells. If we wanna be able to create a normal antibody response, we have to have the nutrients to create those B cells. Chaga is amazing at helping to increase those B cells. And I don't wanna give anything away, but you saw already on the blood work what somebody could have done. Start thinking about what that person probably took, some chaga, and you saw the immediate increase in that immune response. Again, chaga, adaptogenic for B cells, and you can read all about the mechanisms. Again, these things are not new information. It's not secretive. All that information is out there. You just have to ask the right questions and look in the right places. And if you understand how this cascade happens, you're gonna be a step ahead of everybody else and being able to actually take care of your body. And that's exactly what we do. So remember, it's not just the antibody response. It's not just putting the trash out to the curb. It's a whole lot of other things that all have to happen in coordinated action. So if you wanna understand where your body's at and how this is happening, you have to first test and know what's going on in your body. So thank you guys. I appreciate you for sticking around with me tonight. I hope you learned something. If you found this interesting, listen, I want you to share this so as many people as possible can listen to this. It's also gonna be on YouTube. You can go to our YouTube page, The Wellness Way Sarasota. We're gonna post all of these comment, ask me questions, I will get back to you. And again, I'm gonna be doing this, I've committed already to the next 12 weeks that I'm gonna do this. This is the first two part series on the immune system. Next week we're gonna talk about Hashimoto's. I've got some other things lined up but I don't have 12 weeks worth of stuff. So again, 
comment, post, let me know things that you want to hear about specifically. And I'll talk about the Wellness Way's approach to that specific disease and how we can kind of look at things differently. Again, the Wellness Way approach, this is not me. This is the Wellness Way's idea, philosophy. There's about 100 offices across the country. We all think and do things exactly the same. So go to thewellnessway.com. You can type your condition in there. You can learn about it. And you can actually find a doctor near you that can run all of these labs. Now, if there's not a doctor near you, reach out. We can work with you remotely as well. But the biggest thing that we care about is making sure that your body's healthy. We want to change the healthcare system in America. We want to start getting people healthy again. So again, please, if you like this, share it with people that you care about so everybody can start to get the message and we can start to actually take back control of our health. Thank you guys for hanging out with me. Have a good night.